shout. Come on, give a shout. <laughs> you can be seated for just a little while. If you didn't yet have a chance to get a Bible, there is a cart right there by the sign-up poster for today. You're going to need a scripture today. The address uh, is going to be on the screen. We're in Romans chapter 12. I think it's page uh, 1,335 maybe. Uh, 1,337 if you're using the live paperback today. Um, as you move to get a Bible, I got to dismiss the kids yet, don't I? I almost forgot. Oh my, I was so excited. And then all the beautiful green shirts standing in the back. Hey, if your kids are registered for Kids Alive, I'd like to dismiss you right now that you can be a part of that. And if you haven't registered your kids today, but you'd love for them to be in Kids Alive during the rest of the worship service, I invite you to go out with them. They'll take you to the registration table and you'll be able to sign in, sign up. And that way we know who to call in case you forget to pick up your kids right after worship. All right? So, uh, hey, Kids Alive is back in regular season in their, their rhythm, so let's send them off with a shout and some thanksgiving. Yeah. I'm so excited for that. They're going to be in big group in the student center, and so uh, moms and dads, you'll be able to pick them up there right after worship. All right. Page 1,000. Now I got it. Here it is. Page 1,137, Romans 12, verses 1 to 5. That's where we're going to be today. Our scripture for prayer as we get ready to open the Word of God is from Luke 24, 47. And it's also from James 1, John 8, Galatians 5, and Acts 13. Um, a, a bunch of passages that pulled together um, ask Help us ask God to so fill us with a spirit, and you'll know these words, that we're simply not hearers of the word, but we're, finish it for me, but we're also, there it is, doers of the word. So let's pray together, and then we'll jump in. Father God, we give you all the glory because you are the only one who can. Uh, Lord Jesus, you are our only hope and salvation. We look to no other. We have no other name by which we may be saved. You are our only comfort in life and in death that we belong to you no matter what. And so I pray today, Lord, that as we gather together in sweet fellowship, that you will bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Send your Holy Spirit to us to be the teacher and translator of truth today and help us to not be deceived, but to listen to your word and to do it, to be bringers of the good news that in Christ there is freedom and forgiveness. So bless your word today, bless all of us, and bless me to be a good teacher and a pastor in these moments. I thank you for this day, this day of joy and gladness, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start with a pop quiz. Go ahead and put that one word uh, right up on, on the screen. The word is uh, worship. When you see that word, what does it make you think about? What does that word mean to you when you see it? Let's go ahead and share a couple of those out loud. Singing, say it again. His holy name, what else? Praying. Praying. What are some other things? When you see the word worship, when you hear that word, what do you think about? Living. Living, yeah. What did you say? Joy. Praise. Praise. Party. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's actually the Greek meaning for that word. No, it's not really. <laughs> yeah. But there is joy in worship, amen? amen. Yeah, that word that reality of having a life of worship traverses all of the hills and valleys. It is about how we live. When you see this word, often people might think of this experience right here on a Sunday. We even have language for this, right? Like, hey, it's Sunday. We should get up and go to worship or let's go to church. We use that kind of stuff. We call this a worship center. It's amazing to me that often when we see this word, we think about our posture. I don't know about you, um, but my knee when I was growing up was right next to my dad and his hand. If I was being fidgety in church, you know what he would do. He would reach over and squeeze, right? To remind me that I was supposed to sit still in worship. Uh, in one of our churches in Chicago, <laughs> um, I actually got in trouble during our, our, uh, our youth ministry, our student ministry Christmas party. I don't know what we were doing, but for some reason, a bunch of us went running through the worship center while they were um, getting ready for Christmas service. You know, I don't know if they were practicing on the organ or what it was. And we got in so much trouble. Finish this for me, because you're not allowed to run in. <laughs> yeah, so I moved. I'm here now. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, fight or flight. <laughs> I chose flights. They were cheaper. They were on sale. Maybe there's more to this whole thing about worship, more than just this event, more than the one hour on a Sunday morning, more than uh, about posture or not running. Um, are any of you old enough to, uh, to have this in hanging in your closet? Does, did anybody else ever have Sunday clothes? Uh-huh. Come on. Yeah. Your best jeans, right? <laughs> no. They weren't allowed. That's right. They weren't. It's amazing. I wasn't even allowed to wear jeans, blue jeans in high school, and this was in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Mark Harris, he writes for the Fresh Start Bible, uh, a thought called Love Expressed Beyond Music, Biblical Worship is, divi- is dis- Defined by the Heart Position. Let me quote. You probably know that the Bible says you should worship God. You may even feel a deep desire to express your thankfulness to Jesus, your Savior, who rescued you from sin and gave you a brand new life. So the question remains, how do I worship biblically? He says this, should you stand reverently with a hymnal in your hands and sing softly? (laughs) We failed that one today, didn't we? (laughs) Are you supposed to shout and wave your arms? And what about bowing and dancing? What about acts of service like feeding the poor and helping those in need? What's the right way to worship? Last week we said the priority of a live ministries is not its seating capacity, it's its sending capacity. Kerry Newhoff did some research and he says this, when someone merely attends church, the likelihood of showing up regularly or even engaging their faith decreases over time. At our church, he says, I find our most engaged people, people who serve, give, invite, and are in a community group are the most frequent attenders. More and more as a leader, here's the summary of what he's learning, more, <clears throat> excuse me, more and more as a leader, I value engagement over attendance. Ironically, if you value attendance over engagement, you see a decline in attendance. And we know this is part of our new reality. We know that 25% of a life is online, and I'm glad for that. And we're working to discover what online discipleship and community and fellowship and service is all about. And we're learning to be back together again. And attendance is different than what it used to be. A few years ago when we had 969 people in worship, and there's only 500 chairs, that was two services back-to-back, blowing out the doors. It's different today. But that does not mean that we're less engaged in the mission. So we need to get a biblical perspective on worship. That will help us as we rebuild alive because if our perspective of membership or worship is too narrow, if it's only a Sunday uh, morning thing and if it's only a 10 a.m. thing on Sundays, then there's no room to do or to say or to be all the things that we need to do and say and become. Um, My mantra is this, that the small nail of Sunday morning worship is too small to hang everything of our faith life on. Getting a biblical perspective on worship is what we need. Does anybody know offhand how many hours are in a week? 168. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. You know, I actually had to Google it. I didn't know. And seven times 24, it's like carry the four, cross out the nine, divide by seven, and add four. I was wrong. <laughs> There's only three kinds of people, brother, right? Those who can do math and those who can't. All right. Getting a. <laughs> Seven days, 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week. One hour, one hour out of 168 leaves how many? 167. What does worship look like 167 hours a week? If you're a note taker, I'm going to give you three things. The letters D, K, and E. Definition, key, and experience. The definition of what is worship, verses 1 and 2 today. The key to acceptable worship, verse 3, and the experience. What is that, verses 4 and 5? That is Romans 12, 1 through 5 today. So if you're ready to open the scripture, say yes, Terry. Please do. All right, here's number one, the definition. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. What is worship? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
Don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The bottom line, Paul tells us as he writes, is that because God showed us mercy, we respond by giving him our whole selves, our body and our life. We are living sacrifices and offering, doing his will. Here it is. How we live is how we worship. The New Living Translation says it this way. Give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he'll find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. To offer our bodies is literally how we use ourselves, how we use our bodies. Scripture is full of verses that talk about how we should abstain from the sins of the flesh but we should also dedicate the use of our bodies to the glory and purposes of God. All of my energy, every thought of my mind, every affection of my heart, even the motivations that drive my priorities, all of these are what makes me a living sacrifice. The sacrifice for sin, you know what it is, right? The wages of sin is death, and that's done. Jesus already did that. When he said it is finished, he was confirming that he alone is the pleasing and acceptable sacrifice to the Father that covers our guilt and our shame. In Jesus Christ, finish it for me if you know it, there is now no condemnation. You stand free and forgiven. When the blood of Christ covers the sin that's in our lives, the Father sees you in the righteousness that belongs to Jesus, in the holiness that is Jesus, in the acceptable sacrifice that is Jesus. We are free in him, amen? But living sacrifices is what the Scripture calls us to be. I'm glad I don't have to pay the penalty for my sin. That would be that. That would be done. It would be over. I'd be done. I'm called to be a living sacrifice, called to live holy and pleasing. God calls that worship. Verses 1 and 2 teach us that our body and our mind must be transformed as we live a renewed life in his pleasing and perfect will. The way we've said it for years here at Alive, uh, this gesture is the word of God that all of us, no matter who we are, no matter where you've come from, no matter what your Friday night or Saturday night was like, all of us come together to align ourselves in, underneath the word of God. His will for my life. That's worship. Mark Harris says it this way. When we use the gifts God has given us for his glory, we worship him. Many well-meaning Christians think worship only occurs during the church service. But that's not true. On the contrary, worship can and should occur every day of our lives. You see, God gave us his Holy Spirit. We are all, as believers, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, which means we all have Holy Spirit gifts. Some people call them grace gifts. We're all already equipped with everything we need to serve and worship him. And that service is our worship, an offering from the gratitude we have because we're saved. We don't serve and worship in order to be saved. Remember, Jesus did that already. We worship because... We want to. I want to say I love you to my Savior, and I do that by how I live. The teachings in Scripture about spiritual gifts, we went through those a couple of months ago in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. They're often tandem with being careful to not be proud or haughty with your abilities, with the works that you're called to do, because those are from God. God is awesome. It's not about us. It's not the deed that makes me right. It's the heart that makes something an act of worship. So this is number two in the teaching today. The key, the letter K I gave you, the key, humble service, is the key to worship. You see, pride and worship don't coexist. It's about having a humble heart. Listen to Romans 12, verse 3. It's on the screen. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. But think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith 
that God has distributed to each of you. We're going to talk about what that means, that sober judgment, but when I was processing this over this past, these past few weeks, I was reminded of an old story. Um, I don't know, 20-some years ago, I was in a place, and um, the journey was a little bit like a life. And uh, I moved into this church that was just under 1,000 members, and within a couple of years, we went to 3,000 members. And then something happened in leadership. Uh, there were five of us who were ministers, and something happened, and um, the top two ministers left the church. And you can imagine what happened after that. It was difficult. So we had a, a specialized interim minister come and help us through that, understand what happened and who we are and how God is still faithful even when we're unfaithful. And I remember his name is Rick. And one time Rick stood up in front uh, uh, of all of us and he said, you know, I, uh, I write most of my messages in the cafe out by Zealand. Um, and one morning my, my waitress asked, you know, so, so are, you, are you a minister? What are you doing? You're, you're writing a, yeah, he says. And then he said the name of the church where uh, we were at. And he said, have you ever heard of it? No, nope, never heard of it ever once. It's amazing. Seven miles away and never heard of it. And so Rick was able to say, to help us with our pride issues because we grew like crazy in three years, Rick said, just remember, you ain't all that. We needed a dose of that reality to be reminded what we're about and that this is for God's glory and it's his mission we're on. It's his design. The gifts that I have are from him. The gifts that you have are from him. The call that is on your life to be a minister of reconciliation and to bring life into your communities, that's all from him. It's all for him. When the scripture says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment, sober thinking is a very peculiar phrase in the Greek New Testament. It simply means this, so don't overthink it. Don't think about it more than it needs to be. One commentator said it's kind of like this. Remember, you only have some of the gifts. You're not all that. It's not about you. That's sobering to remember. Guess what? It takes all of us. Remember the bicycle that we had here? It takes all of the parts of the bicycle for us to travel down the road together. Take off the handlebars and we're in the ditch. Take off the pedals and there's no power. Remove the chain and you can work like crazy and go, no. it takes all of us. And that's sobering to remember. The mission of God, the plans of God, the body of Christ, it's not about any just one of us. It means it's not up to you. It takes other people. Other people are gifted by God, each doing their role. And God decides the role, the gifts, the purposes, and even the effectiveness. It's amazing, right? And that's the good news. It's not about you, and it's not about me. The other good news is that means that you don't have to go alone. You don't have to do it alone. The really good news is that imagine if we were all Terry's. <laughs> there wouldn't be enough dad jokes to go around. Come on. <laughs> Seriously, though. We're not a personality-driven church. It's not about me. It's not about you. Anyone, any one person, any one ministry, it's simply and always about knowing and loving Jesus and making Jesus known so that others can know him and love him too. That's what seven-day worship is. We live by faith, and faith helps us submit to God how he planned it. And letting God be God, we accept his gifts and our role in his plan, even the pre-planned works that he has for us, and then we go out and do it. And that takes a humble heart to let God be the leader. And sometimes that, that's hard, and this hurt a little bit. It's hard for planners and strategists and the one with the entrepreneur heart. I like to make plans, and I love strategies and workflows and flowcharts and spreadsheets, and oh, man. You should have seen the spreadsheet for today's event. We had a couple of meetings on it, uh, and the event coordinator took care of the rest, and I just had so much joy because all those little boxes started to turn green because they're all done, and pretty soon, Fat Belly Catering. Who would name their company Fat Belly? I'm so excited. Pretty soon, the catering will be here, and there will be food, and we're going to have so much goodness. But to see all the plans come to be, that was exciting for me. 
but I had to remember to keep the focus of what this is all about. It's not about Costco cake, even that's pretty close to heaven. It's not about the catering. Yesterday we were here with a group cleaning up the parking lots and the landscaping. Um, another group came on Friday night and picked up all the trash. We did weeds and dirt, and we had a prayer time afterwards and some Ida cinnamon rolls, but we had some prayer time, and it was in dedication for this because this is what that's all about for the body of Christ to experience fellowship together so that we might be encouraged and help one another to bring life into our communities, to worship together and to honor God and give him the glory by how we live 167 hours a week outside of this hour. Living like that takes a humble heart. Otherwise, our deeds and our, our works are just busyness, especially for guys like me. I love calendars. I have five of them. If we're honest, we can even feel good about a busy calendar. And it's not wrong to serve and to serve a lot. It's not. But verse 3 teaches me, teaches us to be humble when I do the works of God. Robert Morris says it this way, worship is love expressed. And if that's true, then the how of worship is any humble act of service to God. And it doesn't have to be extravagant, but it does have to be an expression from the humble heart. God's mercy produces in me love expressed, service expressed, worship. If worship and pride are like oil and water, as soon as pride comes into it, we can begin to take the glory. We can grab the wheel, climbing into the driver's seat, or worse, we can begin to feel like we deserve God's grace, forgetting that all of us are sinners and all of us are saved by grace through faith, not by works, so there is no boasting. Last point. Number one was the definition of worship. What is it? Uh, the one now is the key to worship is the humble heart and now the experience of worship. I love this word because the experience of worship is belonging. You see, you belong to God. Each one of us belongs to God. We have been redeemed and the cost of that was the blood of the Lamb. Jesus Christ, his blood, takes away the guilt of sinners. He removes that from us. We belong to the Father because of Jesus. We remain attached to the Father in fellowship because of Jesus. And guess what? We belong to one another. You're my family. I'm responsible for you. You're responsible for me. Well, this is the way the Word of God says it. Romans 12, verse 4. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and those members don't all have the same function, listen, so in Christ, verse 5, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Belonging has benefits, doesn't it? It does. What, what are some of the benefits? How have you benefited from being on this journey that's called alive? Just share a couple of words. Give me a one-word testimony. How have you benefited from belonging to Alive? You feel at home, enriched. What else? Encouragement. Encouragement. Say it again. Growing. Growing. Support. Relationships. Prayed for. Healing. Pardon? Peace. One more. Love. Nobody said, I get to wear untucked shirts and jeans to worship. <laughs> That's a benefit. I don't think I've ever laughed so much as when I'm with you. Joy, a fruit of the Spirit because of who you are. Now, the record of that is skewed a little bit because there was last year, but, you know, <laughs> the joy of being a part of this is amazing. We belong together. You see, you make me better. You complement my limited gifts. We all need a word of encouragement and we all need a word of admonition. We're called to serve one another. We're part of the promise that Jesus said, and I'll never leave you alone. He left us you. True worship actually increases belonging. Seven-day worship is dynamic and powerful when we raise our hands, when we bow our knees, when we raise our voices and stand together in worship, we actually increase belonging. Tell me, did you have joy in worship today? Come on, yes. I could feel it. I could hear it. it was, there was energy in the room. 
And it's because of how beautiful you are because you're a worshiper. But it's because of the Spirit of God in you that makes you wonderful. When we comfort someone who's hurting, when we work with integrity for our employers, and even when we disciple our children to know and to love God, we are bringing about belonging. When we bring groceries to someone who's struggling and hungry, when we speak the truth in love and encourage a neighbor, and even when we share our stuff with someone who needs it, we're helping someone to see how much Jesus loves them and that they belong to him. And when they belong to him, they belong to us. My only comfort in life and in death is that I am not my own, but I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He's looking for the condition of our hearts. That's what God is looking for. Worship is not just for talented worship leaders, and we have a lot of them. It's not just about magnificent orators. Rich is amazing. Although those are good things, what God is looking for, what he is looking for is the condition of your heart. Humbly serving as an act of worship. Seven times 24 is 168 hours of God-directed living on Sunday and every day. Listen to how the scriptures help us to know what to do for 167 hours a week in fellowship like small groups and service groups and Bible studies and all the things they did in Acts 2, meeting together every day, serving each other and all those who joined the way. Maybe that's why Hebrews encourage us to not stop meeting together. Hebrews 10 verse 24, it's right here on the screen. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day draw near. And we get to do that in both communities. This community that we call Alive, our groups and our neighborhoods, meeting people, meeting their needs. That's worship. Now, I didn't make this up, by the way. This is from Jesus. Um, in just a second, Matthew 25, 40 will be on the screen, but listen to the verses just ahead of it. Matthew 25, 34, Jesus was teaching about the day that Hebrews just talked about, where he separates sheep and goats, the day of his return. The king will say to those on his, on his right, come you all, uh, all who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world, for I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous ones will say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothes? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And here it is on the screen. Matthew 25, verse 40, Mike drops stuff. Jesus wraps it all up and says, the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. That's worship. Renew is not about membership. It's not about membership papers or signing even that poster. And I want you all to do that today if you haven't. It's not signing something that says, yep, I'm alive there are close to 1,600 names in a database of people who've moved through, and that's fine. Maybe there's no direct correlation to having your name on a piece of paper and being actively engaged. Maybe being actively engaged has a correlation to being here. This is about being actively engaged in the particular mission that God has given to Alive. It's about saying, of all the places to belong, I want to do this with the group of people called Alive Ministries. I want to be a seven-day worshiper and learn how to do that with the people here. Yes, it includes Sunday morning worship, gathering and fellowship, and today, cake. It's about becoming a living sacrifice of praise for God's glory and how we live our lives all week long. That's why we say, what, what are we about? What's our mission statement? Bringing life into our communities by serving them in what they need by growing closer together so we're better equipped to serve together, by bringing life and belonging so they might believe. So may God bless each of us and alive together as we begin our new ministry year. I hope you're able to stay for the Renew event that's gonna happen right after worship. I hope to see you there. I hope you visit a ministry table today and get connected in some place so that uh, your brothers and sisters can bless your life 
and that you can bring a blessing to them. I hope you're able to stay today, to hang out with your friends on the East Lawn for some food and fun and fellowship. Do you know that Carrie Rogers is coming back today to be our MC? I mean, if that's not enough to get you there, maybe Fat Belly will do it, but <laughs> we're planning on you. I want to see you there. I want to hang out with you. It's going to be some wonderful worship out on the lawn today. So let's ask God's blessing for a transformed heart full of worship as we begin our new year. Pray with me. Father God, we have heard your word to us today, so help us to put it into practice. Regardless of the season or the storm, help us to be rock solid in our hope and faith, especially when it's difficult. Lord Jesus, may your Holy Spirit remind us and cause us to remember your word that we might experience true freedom, freedom from slavery to sin, freedom from slavery to our own flesh, freedom from confusion, and even from the enmity we have with our neighbor. Set us free that we might love others as we have been loved by you. Grant us the blessing of fellowship and the sweetness of friendship as we embark on a new church year. May our children grow up to know you and love you and serve you every day of their lives. May our students become more mature to the full measure of the stature of Christ. May all of us be equipped for works of ministry, built up as the body of Christ, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Help us to become all things to all people so that by all possible means we might save some. Accept our worship as holy and pleasing to you today and every day. God, we love you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves, our resources, this church, our lives for however you would use us for your kingdom. For the sake of the gospel, so that we might share in its blessing, and in your Son's name we pray and believe. Amen. <laughs>